The National Research Scientific Computing Center, or NERSC, supports all Department of Energy Office of Science funded research that needs large scale supercomputers and big data systems. And NERSC has been and continues to be an integral part of DOE's Exascale Computing Project since ECP began several years ago. Richard Gerber, NERSC's Senior Science Advisor and HPC Department Head, joins us in this episode of Let's Talk Exascale. Hi, I'm your host, Scott Gibson. Richard's role at NERSC is to ensure that the center remains keenly responsive to the needs of the scientific researchers it serves and continues to tell the facility's science stories. I talked to Richard on 21 December 2022 to gain insights about NERSC of potential interest to many people involved in high performance computing. We covered the expanse of its impact on diverse areas of scientific research across the United States and the world. Additionally, we delved into the collaborative NERSC ECP connections. NERSC, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, and the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility are the supercomputer centers within DOE's Advanced Scientific Computer Research, or OSCAR, program. OSCAR is part of the Office of Science. The leadership facilities differ from NERSC in that they are more technology-oriented and support not only Office of Science work, but also outside projects. Among the topics discussed, NERSC's unique role in the world, the similarities between NERSC and ECP in their efforts to optimize the performance of scientific applications, how the NERSC workload represents the diversity of science areas within the Office of Science, Perlmutter, NERSC's first large GPU-based system, the NERSC Scientific Application Program, or NESAP, the integration of ECP application development projects into NESAP programming, how the HPC experts at NERSC are ensuring products developed by ECP software technology are installed properly at NERSC. Richard's perspectives on how ECP products are already making a difference and what he thinks ECP's legacy will be. Richard on his role at NERSC. Yes, um, thank you very much. I'm the, um, the NERSC High Performance Computing Department Head. Um, so we, we have three departments right now, a systems department, a data department, and then my department. So in my department, I have a number of groups. Um, user engagement uh, includes um, consulting, um, third-party software, um, that sort of thing. Application performance, which is the, uh, a lot of the work is very similar to the kind of work that went in in the application development part of ECP. In fact, they're very, very similar. Um, we have an advanced technologies group that's looking at uh, a few years out the kind of technologies that w will be in HPC systems and how they map onto our workload. We just started a programming environment and models group. And then I also have a business operations and services group. I'm also the senior science advisor, and um, in that role, I, I kind of make sure that the nurse remains science focused and help tell science stories to staff and DOE and to the general public and to the lab and that sort of thing. Um, I started in HPC back when I was in graduate school in the in the 80s and 90s at the University of Illinois, where I was studying astrophysics and physics and was introduced to um, NCSA, which was just getting started, and they had a, a Cray system, one of the biggest Cray systems in the world at the time, and I started working on that in my research. And then when I graduated, I had a postdoctoral fellowship at NASA Ames, that also at the time had one of the bi biggest computers in the world, um, at the Connection Machine, one of the CM2, and also a very large Cray system. So I got uh, a lot of experience with just the, the vector processors and then in the beginning of distributed memory processors and the connection machine, which was a little bit different, but was really um, the first parallel machine that I'd worked on. And then after that, I was hired at NERSC and I've been through all the generations of machines that NERSC had starting again in 96, we had some vector machines and then they've all been distributed memory systems since then. NERSC's workload reflects the entire DOE Office of Science research community. So we have the unique role um, in the world of being this, the high performance computing and data center that supports all the research that's being um, done within the Office of Science. So if you look at our workload, it reflects the distribution of, of science areas. And um, if you look at actually the Office of Science org chart, it pretty well represents the, the diversity of, of science areas. So we have advanced computing, we have um, bioenergy and genomics, earth and environmental systems, a lot of climate research that um, is done in that area. 
And then in basic energy sciences, we have material science and chemistry. And those, those two areas actually represent the largest fraction of our users and, and the hours that are used at NERSC. There's also a user facilities um, part of BES in which we're supporting uh, a lot of the experimental work that is being done at the, at, the, at the Office of Science user facilities. And then there is research going on in nuclear physics, which is uh, a lot of QCD, but also nucleosynthesis and supernova explosions, and high energy physics, which is particle physics, astrophysics, um, cosmology, that sort of thing. And then uh, fusion energy sciences, which is looking at fusion energy and plasma physics. And in fact, NERS started as a center to support um, fusion energy sciences uh, back at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in 1974. So we've been around for a long time. Richard compared and contrasted NERSC and the Leadership Computing Facilities, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility and the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. Right, so those three centers, NERSC, OLCF, and LCF, make up the uh, supercomputer centers that are within within OSCAR, within Advanced Scientific Computer Research, within the Office of Science. Um, as I said, our role is to support the research in the Office of Science that's funded by the Office of Science primarily that needs the kinds of systems that we have. So very large scale um, supercomputers and big data systems. The focus of the leadership facilities is a little bit different and a little bit more technology oriented, I think, um, enabling the most advanced technologies for science in general. And so that, a lot of that includes the Office of Science, but their scope is a little bit broader in terms of science areas outside the Office of Science domain. The Perlmutter supercomputer at NERSC is ranked number eight on the most recent Top 500 list of the most powerful commercially available machines known to the Top 500 organization. It's based on the HPE Cray Shasta platform and is a heterogeneous system with AMD Epic-based nodes and 1,536 NVIDIA A100 accelerated nodes. Richard summarized his view of the system's contribution to scientific research so far. Like all our systems we get, we try to get the system that we think will bring the most value, the most opportunity to scientists uh, from the Office of Science. And Perlmutter was our first large GPU-based system, and so we were, we were a little um, uncertain about how well the workload would be able to map onto it. So that was one of the reasons we started uh, what we call NESAP, which is the NERSC Exascale Scientific Application Program. And for those of you familiar with ECP, it's structured very much like the application development part of ECP. So we engaged with about 25 research teams that were developing codes that made up a large percentage, about half of all of our workload. And we've been working with them for about three, three and a half years to make sure their codes are ready for GPUs. And partially because of that, um, also partially because of all the work that's going on, that went on at the same time within ECP itself, and the fact that GPUs have been around uh, now for a little bit, from day one, our users just jumped on the system. As soon as we were able to open it up to users, the machine was completely full with scientists running all kinds of things they've never been able to run before. So we had immediately had some large uh, applications running in like, earthquake simulations. We're doing things at scale that they never could before. We had some protein interactions that were using new AI techniques uh, for which the system is really, really well suited that we're able to do some things that, again, were, were never done before. And so there was a lot of work on the system immediately. And since we opened it up to users uh, starting last year and then more so this year, it's been essentially 100% used all the time. And the backload in the queues is, is, is probably greater than any system that I've ever seen in, in all my years at NERSC. Um, and so it's just been, it's been, I've been already, even though it's not yet quite in its, in its final configuration, it's just been a, a scientific workhorse so far for everybody. So we're really pleased about that. Perlmutter was deployed in two phases. It's been a little bit slower coming fully online than we had hoped in large part because of supply chain issues and, and that sort of thing, and, and COVID didn't help. So we brought it in in two phases. So we brought in one phase, which was the GPU-enabled nodes, about 1,500 of them. We brought them in in late 2021, running what's known as the Slingshot 10 high-speed network. 
So that was not meant to be its final configuration, but we wanted to get them available to scientists and to get our hands on the system. So that started in late 2021, and we started letting users on in waves. So the first wave was the, these NESAP teams and um, all the ECP teams that wanted to get on, we let have access. So that was in late 21, and then by spring of this year, we'd enabled all of our users. Anybody that had um, GPU-enabled code could get on the system. And then since that time, we've been slowly adding the CPU-only nodes. So we have about uh, 3,000 CPU-only nodes, and we have not yet quite finished integrating all those nodes into the systems. So that works. work is still ongoing. Richard explained how NERSC and the Exascale Computing Project closely collaborate. We've been uh, very involved with ECP um, from the beginning. And so, for instance, we have people in, in various roles. Um, Katie Antipas, our uh, division deputy, is the hardware and integration director within ECP. And Jack DeSlip, who heads our NESAP program, is, leads the ECP apps in, in chemistry and material science. Um, so that's been a great relationship for us. And then we've had other people involved at other levels within the project as well. As I mentioned, I mentioned our NESAP program. We also effectively integrated, I think it was five or six AD projects into our NESAP program. We, we kind of adopted them. And so that was an addition to the ones that we'd already been working with. So been very involved there as well. We've also been very involved with the ST teams, so the software technologies teams. And we were, I think, very early on, uh, very involved uh, with the software integration and the continuous integration projects that are going on within ECP. So, we've, for instance, we have three people now working just on that part of ECP at NERSC to make sure that the, the software products that were developed through ST, um, including E4S and the SDKs, are installed well at NERSC that users can log into our system and get access to them and use them. And through that whole process, there's been a lot of, you know, figuring out all the, th out all the things that do work and that don't work. And this is a, a lot of very hard, non-trivial work, you know, taking the products and then actually making them work in the software environment and with the hardware that actually exists at the facilities. We've also been very involved and very collaborative with the project in terms of training and hackathons and that sort of thing. And then there's a part of ECP that, that uh, is focused on how the project integrates with the facilities, so uh, both us and uh, OLCF and ALCF. So we're very, very actively part of that discussion. And like the other facilities, we have made time available to the ECP teams that wanted to use NERSC through our director's reserve allocation. So I, I looked up some of the numbers. I think last year we had, yeah, last year we had 56 ECP projects who were using NERSC, both our, our Cori system and the Perlmutter system when it came online. And a lot of that work has been testing codes, developing codes, and a lot of code optimization because Perlmutter at a very high, at a high level looks a lot like the exascale systems are going to look with the, with CPUs and GPUs uh, supporting those. Richard said ECP products are making a big impact in the high-performance computing community. So ECP has been, I think, a really great project and enabled a lot of great things um, for us as well as for the project and, and the other systems. You know, I mentioned the, I mentioned when Perlmutter come, came online, we had immediately lots of projects that were able to start using it uh, immediately. And uh, many of those were because of codes that had been developed through ECP. So um, EQSIM was, was earthquake code. There's a lot of codes that were enabled through the work of the AMR efforts that are within ECP. So from an application perspective, the impact has been great and immediate, I think. So that's been fantastic. And in the software technologies areas, there are so many enabling technologies like libraries and tools languages like Cocos and that sort of thing that people are already using. And so the impact is already making a big impact in, in the community and for um, NERSC and its users having access to the, all that software. It, it's really benefited us as well. His perspective on ECP's legacy. So I, I really like what ECP became. And I think that in addition to all the 
the software that is currently available and being used uh, productively on the systems. I think its legacy will have a lot to do with what it did to bring the community together to to work together in a in a uh, more coordinated way. So a lot of efforts were going on um, from a lot of different people, but the community at large really didn't have kind of a center of gravity or a, a, a focus that ECP has brought. So for instance, the bringing together of the domain scientists, the applied mathematicians, the computer scientists, the facility people, the optimization experts together to work on problems and like AD did, I think it's just a way of working that I think will continue. It just, it's just now kind of part of the, it's part of the ethos and it's part of, it's, it's just part of the landscape of HPC now. And so I think that um, will be a great, one great legacy from ECP. And also on the, the software, on the software technology side, the, the same thing has happened. So when ECP started, one of the first things it did was create some this idea of these SDKs that would, that would work together. And so there were a lot of great software products out there already, a lot of scientists were using them. But again, some of the, uh, what you might think of as simple things um, weren't really happening. Like there was no guarantee that one software library would be compatible with another one, even if you wanted to use it, use the both together. So there could be namesakes, collisions, or whatever. These SDKs really brought these developers together and worked out all these issues and made um, toolkits that scientists could use productively and not have to worry about these things. And then, of course, we have E4S software project, which I think is an extension of that, which is really defined a new way for the community to look at software as a whole. So it is set up um, a lot with promoting best practices for software engineering, for example, best practices for documentation, for how you support software, how you test it, how you do continuous integration, how you get it integrated into the facility so that it actually will work with the software environments, the hardware, the nuances, all the facilities. And so that is also, I think, going to be, a, we're working in a new way that we didn't before. And I think it's to the benefit of everybody. Richard discussed the magnitude and diversity of the work being done at NERSC. We have about getting close to 10,000 users. And these users are working on projects that are mostly funded by the Office of Science, but they are actually mostly at universities. So a university professor will get a, a, a grant of, of money to work on a project in materials for batteries or, or whatever. And then they will use NERSC and a lot of the people that end up using NERSC are their students and postdocs and that sort of thing. Of course, we have a lot of users that are at national labs as well. And we have a few from industry and nonprofits and that sort of thing. We have about getting close to a thousand different projects that people are working on as well. And so that means that there's a lot of codes, a very diverse user base, and they're not just from the U.S., they're from all over the world, um, they do have a commonality that they're all working on these DOE-funded projects. But um, it's, it's a very diverse user base that we have. He said that digging down to understand the needs of users leads to better system design choices and a better experience for all the researchers. So I'm you know, personally very interested in, I guess, what you would call workload characterization. And, and the reason is really to do with understanding our users, understanding their codes, understanding their needs, understanding how they use our system. And it's just a piece of the puzzle. You know, we talk to scientists and we have them fill out surveys and we look at their applications to use time for what they're doing. But uh, synthesizing all these, um, these sources of information really lets us understand, I think, as well as we can, and we're always trying to do more, how users use our systems. Wow what their codes are doing. And the reason we're interested is so we can figure out how to best address their needs and also how to best configure, design, and procure our next system. So we have lots of design choices that we can make when um, procuring a system, and, and, most, and those go into what we ask for, so our, our, our call for proposals and, and 
request for proposals that we put out onto the street. And so this helps a lot with that. So one, one example maybe of how we've used this recently is I talked about NESAP and how we have 20 or so codes, 25 codes in NESAP. And that does represent about half of our workload, those codes. But there's another half that isn't represented there. And so that's a significant portion of our workload. But if you actually look at it, that's distributed amongst what we call this, this long tail. So there's hundreds of thousands of users and codes and, and different things there. So we were going through and looking at different communities, say this material science community, and trying to assess if, whether or not they were ready to use GPUs. And we were able to use um, our workload characterization infrastructure that we have so far to be able to go in and see what codes they were running, you know, how they were running them, and try to map those codes onto GPU readiness for those codes that we might know externally. And so we were able to do all that without actually having to talk to all of the, say, 2,000 or so users that are doing material science research and assess that for the, for the most part, our community, the material science community that's currently using NERSC is actually um, quite well positioned to use GPUs. And so that was... That was comforting to us and um, to the program managers within DOE that, that oversee material science research and also let us know that this is not an area that we need to um, spend a huge amount of effort looking into further because the, they're already doing quite well. Is what's learned from the workload characterization at NERSC extensible to other facilities? I mean, it certainly would be if they have are running similar codes. And I do know that we do get asked a lot about this um, particularly from vendors. So for for example, um, NVIDIA or, or HPE, Cray, are, are very interested in this kind of uh, information for the same reason that we are, just making sure that the future systems are able to support the kind of activities that are going on. Richard said that nailing down the best approaches for collecting, sorting, and making sense of workload characterization data is perpetually challenging. It is very challenging to, to collect this information um, partly because there's potentially a lot of information. And so they're just dealing with lots of information. Lots of data itself it is an issue at times. You oftentimes don't really know what the right questions are to ask, too. So that's, that's another challenge. But beyond those two, if you look at the data itself, the data is often data that we can get our hands on, but it was not necessarily data that was designed to answer any questions that we might be interested in. So chip manufacturers, network designers, uh, people that design, um, like I said, networks or interconnects have counters and things in the hardware that they can measure and, and we have hooks into measuring. But usually they are designed to answer some question that the designer was interested in, like is this thing working right or is this thing doing the right thing and mapping those onto metrics that are interesting to us is, is also a challenge. And the fact that the data that you can pull from these various counters and things like that are of wildly different quality and formats and um, that sort of thing is makes this kind of data wrangling and merging and joining of data streams is extremely difficult. What sorts of systems are in place to make the task a little easier? Well, this is, a, this is an ongoing issue for us. And so we're collaborating with a lot of other centers, too, to try to figure out how to, how to best do this. There are some things that are making it easier. There, there are some projects like um, LDMS is now um, a way to collect data and to report data that is common, more commonly being used at various centers. And there are um, technologies for storing data that makes it easier to, to get out large data sets and to query large data sets. Um, but we're still, trying to, we're still trying to piece those all together. So um, I'm not sure I have a, a system that I, I could give you right now that I would say, you know, copy us and, and do what we're doing. We're, we're, we're both exploring ways to, to do it better and trying to use the data as we can get it at the same time. Here's more on LDMS, which, for reference, is the Lightweight Distributed Metric Service. It provides a way to be able to collect data from nodes while jobs are running. 
and a transport mechanism that then puts it on a bus or has some way to transport that out to whatever external system you want it to store it on. So it's, it's a way of moving performance and counter data that you might want to collect off of a system onto something else. What is NERSC currently up to? We're trying to finish off configuring and integrating all the pieces of Perlmutter and making that available to all our users as a full system. We're already working really hard on Nurse 10. So we, we number our procurements and Perlmutter was Nurse 9 and Nurse 10 will be our next one. And so we already have, um, for those of you who know what uh, a CD0 is, we have the CD0. It's basically, it's basically it's showing a mission need for this system and getting that approved. So we've done that and we will be putting out a um, call for proposals for that system sometime later this year. So there's a lot of activities there. We're looking at NESAP and try to redefine the role of it from being a little bit less focused on the performance of an individual application to the performance of an entire scientific workflow. So that could include uh, moving data, post-run analysis, integration of simulation and experimental data, and how do you optimize that? How do you measure that? How do you enable that to work better? So we're looking a lot at, at workflows. As I said, we're thinking about how can we make our systems more resilient? So a lot of that is being driven by the interactions we're having with the um, experimental facilities within the Office of Science. And how can we support their needs for high performance computing in their data analysis? And oftentimes they have needs for real time or you know, live data analysis, and how do we coordinate all that and make our systems available in a more resilient way? So that's a big thing we're working on. We're looking at how to continue to leverage um, AI and deep learning for science, both for data analysis and as it applies to data, but also as it applies to enabling simulations to be able to do things faster. And then we're also very much exploring how quantum systems are going to impact science in the future. So how can, how can quantum computers or quantum accelerators be used to attack the same kinds of problems that our users are attacking right now? And what new kinds of problems would they enable? And how does a center like NERSC or a user facility look when quantum technologies are available? Richard summed up the overall frenetic activity at NERSC. So much is going on, but at the same time, it's really exciting. So all the work on Perlmutter is really challenging and exciting, looking for the next system also, and then all the new kinds of techniques and the new kinds of science and the new kinds of capabilities that are being enabled by these GPU systems with the tensor cores and the, the developments in AI and how that is being applied to science and to calculations uh, is really changing the landscape. So there's a lot going on. It's all really fascinating and interesting and just trying to try to apply our finite resources to kind of an infinite number of interesting things, I think is kind of how a lot of people feel right now. He shared more about the ECP NERSC connection. I think that NERSC has been really involved with ECP and I hope it's been to the benefit of both of us. Our, our user community and the community of applications and software technologies that have been involved in ECP are really one and the same. And I really like what ECP has done and what they've become. And partially it's because I really think that there is, a, I think that there will be a big impact. It's a big opportunity. I think there will be a big impact on how scientific computing is, is done and the benefit to science. I think it's really, it's really going to be great. So, um, I've really been happy how, how much we've been able to work with ECP and how welcoming they've been to us working with them. And, um, yeah, I really can't, I really can't say enough about, uh, I think the impact that, that has had and, and the, the legacy of having the community work together more closely is really, is really exciting to me. And, and I think it's something that we didn't really have before to the extent that we do now. Much appreciation to Richard Gerber of NERSC for being a guest on Let's Talk Exascale. And thank you for listening. Visit exascaleproject.org, subscribe to ECP's YouTube channel. Our handle is Exascale Computing Project. Additionally, follow ECP on Twitter at Exascale Project. 
The Exascale Computing Project is a U.S. Department of Energy multi-lab collaboration to develop a capable and enduring exascale ecosystem for the nation. Thank you.